The third dogma proclaimed by the Church concerning our Blessed Virgin Mary is the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Now, there's two ways you can use the word controversy. Uh, the first is that something in itself is dubious, uh, questionable, uh, even inappropriate. The second connotation of controversial is that because it's not understood in its essence, it causes confusion, great debate, uh, even uh, moments of misunderstanding. Well, it is only in that second context of the term controversial that we can call the dogma of the Immaculate Conception one of the most controversial dogmas in the process of becoming a dogma in the Church's history. As we'll examine, you'll see, especially in the 12th and 13th century, uh, rejections of this truth, not because great minds like St. Bernard of Clairvaux and St. Thomas Aquinas thought there was an intrinsic problem in the doctrine in that Our Lady did not deserve it, but rather because the, the truth was in contradiction to related truths that in fact showed up historically to not be accurate, but these theologians were seeing that if the Immaculate Conception is true, then this is not true, and we'll talk about the this and that. Uh, but in fact, it was the peripheral ideas, for example, the idea of how original sin is transmitted, that was what was in fact erroneous. So, we're going to talk about this beautiful dogma in three components, and in fact in three segments. The first, I want to go after the actual proclamation that is made by Blessed Pius IX in 1854. Uh, it, it's, it's a beautifully craft, crafted definition, and I want to discuss the key elements to the actual uh, definition itself. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about the presence of the Immaculate Conception in Scripture and in tradition. And indeed, you will see a beautiful development of doctrine, uh, which is clearly established by the end of the first millennium, but is certainly present even within the first three centuries of the Catholic Church. And in our last segment concerning the Immaculate Conception, we're going to go back to those 12th and 13th century controversies uh, and, and, and uh, misunderstandings, which did lead to a approximate 7th century uh, battle concerning this great Marian truth. So, let's begin with the actual dogmatic statement, once again, December 8th, 1854, an infallible statement by Blessed Pius IX. This is the statement. I want to read it to you, and again, I want to highlight uh, some of the key elements to it. The statement proclaims, quote, We declare, pronounce, and define that the doctrine which holds that the Most Blessed Virgin Mary, at the first instant of her conception, was preserved immune from all stain of sin by a singular grace and privilege of the omnipotent God, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race, was revealed by God and therefore must be firmly and constantly believed by all the faithful. So, key elements to this definition. First of all, the recipient of this privilege, this unique privilege, as uh, Pius IX specifies, is Mary at the moment that God infuses the soul into the zygote or embryo, the, 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 the new union of sperm and egg in the womb of Anne. That's what we call passive conception. From that moment, from the moment God infuses the soul, Mary is preserved from original sin and all of its effects. Uh, the first thing this reminds us, my friends, is that this is extremely an extremely uh, pro-life dogma. We're not talking about an immaculate animation. Uh, we're not talking about an immaculate gestation. We're talking about an immaculate conception, which presupposes what? That there's a human being at the moment of conception, which all legitimate embryology uh, and even now the, the, the aid of, of technical studies of what takes place in the womb, all of this confirms that you're talking about life 
human life, personal human life, beginning at the moment of conception. But it is already intrinsically related to the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. It's not just cells, it's the person of Mary from the moment of conception who is preserved from original sin and its effects. Now, when we talk about the effects of original sin, the only way we can fully understand that and appreciate it is to talk about how Adam and Eve, our first set of human parents, how they were created, and specific, what gifts did they have when they were crea created. Secondly, what happens with the fall of Adam and Eve. And thirdly, how that relates to the issue of Mary. So let's start at the beginning. The scholastics uh, talked about the levels of gifts, and of course, contemporary theology does as well. Uh, the, I'm going to use some of the terms of the scholastics because it's still fairly embedded in uh, theological discussion today. So Adam and Eve were granted the following three sets of gifts when the Father created them. First of all, what we call the natural gifts. The natural gifts would constitute the soul, the body, the intellect, the will, all things appropriate to the human nature. These are the gifts of nature that God gives Adam and Eve. The second set of gifts are called by the scholastics the preternatural gifts. And keep in mind now, we're talking about what are the gifts that God gives man created, human beings from the beginning? Okay. And the preternatural gifts, even though there's an extensive list of, of these, I'm going to focus on the three principal preternatural gifts. Number one, infused knowledge. This means that Adam and Eve were given an accentuated knowledge of recognizing the supernatural within the natural realm. This means that the first set of human parents saw the God-intended purpose of things, and that is what was meant by infused knowledge. It, it doesn't imply that Adam and Eve knew who's going to win the American Civil War or the Battle of 1812, that they knew all the future. It's an infused knowledge to perceive the supernatural, and Adam and Eve had this. And we see how God the Father calls Adam to share, even in the naming of, cre uh, of creatures, uh, bringing them each to Adam, and whatever Adam calls them uh, is their name. So, infused knowledge, the first preternatural gift. Secondly, the second preternatural gift is the gift of what the scholastics called integrity. Now, integrity is a perfect harmony between the emotions and reason, that the passions would follow the dictates, the, the commands, the directives of the intellect and the will. Now, doesn't it make absolute sense that God is going to start us in a good order, in, in a proper order? God is not going to create man with an interior rebellion, uh, with a disorder where the emotions typically disobey the intellect and the will. And so we see that integrity means that if Adam said, okay, it's Friday, today we're going to fast, the emotions would say, okay, today we fast. There would not be an interior battle or rebellion. Uh, we can hopefully see the difference between man created and man fallen, as uh, St. John Paul II would explain in his Theology of the Body. Uh, man fallen certain ha certainly has a battle, and we'll talk about the element of concupiscence uh, in just a few moments. So, Adam and Eve are going to have this order of the emotions obeying the intellect and the will, because God's going to create them with a proper hierarchy of these goods and these values uh, within themselves. That's, that's, that's original human being anthropology. Thirdly, Adam and Eve are created with an immortality, a natural immortality of the body. That is, Adam and Eve are not going to experience cancer or diabetes or polio. 
Once again, God the Father is not going to create them with a disease, with a bodily breakdown. We will see, sadly, this enters the world because man rejects God. The human person says no. So, those are the three preternatural gifts. And again, if this, is, this will be important as we then turn to the issue of Mary. The third set of gifts originally given to Adam and Eve would be the supernatural gift. That is, that Adam and Eve would start their existence in communion with God, with divine intimacy. Uh, they would begin life in grace, in some authentic communication and saving communication with God. So, we have once again the natural gifts, the preternatural gifts, the supernatural gifts. That's what Adam and Eve begin with. Well, then what happens? Well, sin happens. And with sin, the human race will lose their preternatural gifts and their supernatural gifts. So, for example, instead of an infused knowledge, we, uh, and, and, and I want to emphasize this from the beginning, we're not talking about a corrupt nature now. We're talking about a fallen nature. We're not talking about a nature that's intrinsically evil and seeks evil. We're talking about a nature that still seeks good, but it does so in an obscured way. And that would be the difference between the infused knowledge that God gives Adam and Eve and now an obscured knowledge. It's more difficult to see the good, but man is still ordained to see the good. Secondly, in the place of integrity, we have concupiscence. Now, once again, let's get an accurate anthropological understanding of that in light of Catholic revelation and tradition. Concupiscence does not mean man is corrupt. It means man now, human beings, I'm using man in the generic sense as, as, as St. John Paul II does when he talks about his theology of the body, that concupiscence is an interior inclination to evil because of the fall. So instead of the perfect order of the emotions to the reason, now the emotions uh, like to disobey. St. Paul talks about this internal rebellion many times in, in his letters. So concupiscence is an internal inclination towards evil of a, of, a, of a human creature still basically created in God's image, still basically good. Thirdly, instead of having immortality of the body, we have death. Death through material corruption, as the scholastics would tell us. Death through the breakdown of the body. This is what leads to the cancers and the diabetes and the polio, etc. Now, most sadly, the human person loses their supernatural gift. That means that a human being is not created in grace. It's a sad thing. It means we're not in the family of God from the beginning as Adam and Eve were. Now, we can restore, humans can restore their supernatural gifts through the powerful grace and the meaning effable mercy of, of sacramental baptism, right? That restores the life of grace to the human soul. But we do not retain our preternatural gifts. It's rather fascinating that on occasion, if, if God wants to point or Jesus wants to accentuate a, a, a disciple, a saint, what happens? Well, on occasion, on a rare occasion, their bodies are incorrupt. Is that because they have the full preternatural gift? No, it's because God is saying, look at this person. This is someone I want you to emulate, to, to, I want the church to raise up, to appreciate, uh, and in most cases, at least a significant number of cases, to canonize so that we can universally uh, appreciate the example of Christian love of this individual. But we as a human race, do not get back our preternatural gifts. All right, now let's apply all of this to the mother of Jesus. It's a very simple dimension of the dogma that Mary is preserved from, from the moment of conception. Mary is preserved from original sin and its effects. Logically and theologically, that means the following. 
And first of all, Mary is going to retain her preternatural gifts. She's going to have infused knowledge. And isn't that manifest in the infancy narratives where Scripture says, says Mary kept these things, pondering them in her heart. That what others saw were just a, a basic ritual. You, you're going to, the, to present your child at the temple. You, you do your offering and, and let's move it on. We've got a lot of kids this month and let, let's keep it moving. And this is something we, we do. It's a good thing, but it's not. No, no. For Mary, she saw the supernatural significance of these events. Why? Because she retained her infused knowledge. That's why St. John Paul II will say that Mary becomes not only a teacher, but also the memory for the church uh, in his apostolic letter on the rosary. Secondly, Mary will retain the gift of integrity. That means Mary will experience no concupiscence. Now, some might conclude, and, and erroneously so, well, that, does, that kind of takes away all of her merit, doesn't it? Look, she has no concupiscence. She has no internal inclination to evil. So, of course, she's going to have a life free from sin. That would be wrong. Let me raise another quick example. Eve. Eve had all of the preternatural gifts. Eve had no concupiscence. Eve, Eve had no internal inclination to evil, but Eve sinned. Why? Because... It only takes a free will to sin, my friends. Uh, we even learn that in the uh, world of angelology uh, when we examine the testing, the original testing of the angels, and we see that Lucifer became Satan without the suggestion of an external source because there was no Satan yet. And so, yes, Eve has an external tentor in the serpent, which is Satan, but she does not have internal concupiscence, and still she sinned. All it takes is a free will to sin. So Mary would not experience the uh, effects of sin and therefore would not experience concupiscence. Thirdly, Mary would retain the natural immortality of the body. And this is why it can be said that Mary's assumption is the natural effect of her immaculate conception. And we'll talk about the issue of the death of Mary when we talk about the Assumption. But be clear, even you know, as a teaser here, whenever you talk about the death of Mary, it cannot be. It cannot be through the breakdown of the body. It cannot be through the corruption of the body because that's an effect of sin and the mother of Jesus was free from the effect of sin. It could have been, as we will discuss, Mary's discipleship who wished to imitate Jesus, even in a temporary separation of soul and body. More on that when we get to the Assumption. And finally, Mary would, of course, maintain her supernatural gift because she, she's not only within the family of God, but she has the plenitude of grace. So, this gives us a little idea of why we, to use gross understatement, why we consider Mary special. She's full of grace, and she doesn't have the effects of sin, which means she's going to have natural, preternatural, and supernatural gifts. In fact, uh, hopefully you can appreciate the joy of the Heavenly Father, the, the Creator, that one time He's free to create His masterpiece. He's free to create an image of Him, a human being, but not to withhold the grace that He would want to give, but that he must withhold because of the first sin of our first human parents of Adam and Eve. Now, at the end of the definition, Blessed Pius IX makes a critical point where he says that Mary is, quote, preserved in view of the merits of Jesus Christ. We'll talk about this in the objections to the Immaculate Conception in our third lecture on this topic. But let's establish here clearly Mary needed to be saved as a daughter of Adam and Eve. Mary was saved by the merits of Jesus Christ. Mary was saved in a higher fashion than any other human being in virtue of her immaculate conception. Therefore, Mary owes more to Jesus as her Redeemer 
than any other creature. The brilliance of one Franciscan theologian, Blessed John Duns Scotus, will clarify this previous objection in the breakthrough theological concept of what we call preservative redemption and how it is applied to Mary at the moment of her conception and how indeed Mary receives the grace of salvation from Jesus Christ, her Son and Redeemer. As a final word, uh, I just want to emphasize once again that Blessed Pius IX specifies that the Immaculate Conception is a unique privilege. No other creature is going to be immaculately conceived. Adam and Eve started in grace, uh, but Adam and Eve, of course, fall. Jesus, who, the God-man, of course, will begin his life with an immaculate conception in the sense that it comes from his mother, right? Uh, this, this woman conveying a nature identical to her own, back to our definition of motherhood. Well, Mary gives to Jesus her immaculate nature, uh, but there will be no other creature. You can talk about, as the church does rightfully, uh, the pre-sanctification of John in the womb, uh, where John leaps uh, as the unborn John uh, in the presence of Mary and also in the presence of the unborn Jesus. You can well entertain a theological position which, which the great Josephite theologians uh, the theology concerning St. Joseph have held that St. Joseph also received a type of baptism in the womb because of his dignified role, his uniquely dignified role as the guardian of the Redeemer. But no other creature was immaculately conceived, and this is a unique privilege for the mother of the Savior and in order that she can properly fulfill her mission as the mother of God and as the Immaculate Co-Redemptrix with Jesus, as the new Adam, as, excuse me, as the new Eve with the new Adam in the restoration of grace to the human family. So we're going to take a lecture break here, and in the next lecture we will then discuss the Immaculate Conception in the sources of divine revelation, particularly scripture and tradition. Thank you.